You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Good evening. If you would please join with me in turning to the book of Romans, chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We read beginning with verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. What Paul has charged, he is now defending. He has charged that all mankind is under sin. Under the penalty of sin, under the power of sin, under the pollution of sin. And the reason he has to make this charge is because to the Jew it was not self-evident. The case that Paul is making is this, when it comes to the matter of sin, the Jew has no advantage over the Gentile. When it comes to the need for grace, when it comes to the need for forgiveness, when it comes to the need for salvation, for a Savior... The Jew is not any better off. That's what he says in verse 9. As I said, as we have said so far in our study of Romans, Paul is explaining the gospel, but he's also defending the gospel. He's writing to the church so that God's people might not only better understand the gospel themselves, but might be better prepared to defend it because they're going to meet with objections all around. As we said before, man is not just an idol factory, he's an objection factory. Fights against God, fights against God's word at every turn, and so God's people must be prepared to give God's answers to the questions that men raise. And so the way that Paul defends the gospel against the Jewish objector who is certainly going to be met with, the way he answers the objections is to take them to their own Bible. He takes them to the Word of God. And so what he states in verses 10 down to verse 18 represents just an unleashing of Scripture. Psalm 14, Psalm 53, Psalm 5, Psalm 140, Psalm 36, Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 59. 
Paul quotes from these chapters, and he's, what he's doing is he's giving man's true condition, God's assessment of mankind in God's own words. He describes the character of the natural man. No one is righteous. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Everybody is on the wrong road. All together they have become useless. No one does good. And then in the next section of Scripture, he shows that this spiritual condition is always on display in man's words. Man affirms God's assessment of him. Man affirms God's words unwillingly, but he affirms God's words with his own words. His mouth reveals his true spiritual condition. We saw this morning that man's mouth reveals death and deception and deadly poison and disdain, not only for God, but for mankind created in the image of God. And now when we come to verses 15 to 18, we see that what is in man's speech is eventually on display in man's steps. What is in his heart is on his lips, and what is on his lips is manifested in his living. It's not just his heart, it's not just his mouth, it's his behavior that demonstrates that God's assessment is in the Bible, is absolutely true. By doing this, Paul is also demonstrating what it means to be under sin. And what he's showing is that it's not only true to say that all of mankind is under sin, it's also true to say that all of man is under sin. It's not just that all people are under sin, but every aspect of man himself has been polluted by sin. Do you notice how as he is giving these verses, all of man's physical nature, as it were, is involved. He talks about the throat. He talks about the tongue. He talks about the lips. He talks about the mouth. He talks about the feet. Every aspect of man's being has been polluted by the fall So man's spiritual condition is on display in how man lives, and what he gives us in verses 15 to 18 is a description of the pathway of spiritual death. We talked this morning about the speech of spiritual death, what spiritual death looks like in words. Now we see what spiritual death looks like in behavior, in a pathway, in a way of living. And we will describe what Paul describes under three headings. The first one is this. The Bible reveals that man, since the fall, man is now a murderous creature. He is a murderous creature. Verse 15 says, their feet are swift to shed blood. The statement is straightforward. The only only difficulty with the statement is that men don't want to believe it. But what God says is man runs swiftly to kill. He is by nature a murderer, a destroyer. Not always destroying physically, not always taking someone's life with a gun or a knife or in some way like that, but he is a destroyer of other people. The animus that is in his heart and on his lips works its way out through his life, through his behaviors and his treatment of other people. And to describe man like this reminds us of the source of the temptation by which man was slain himself. The the, the, the tempter who gave the temptation by which Adam fell, it also reminds us of the domain that every natural man belongs to. John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil, 
and your will is to do your father's desires, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. The devil is a liar, and his lies serve his murderous interests and desires. He is a killer. And so his lies destroy. How did he slay Adam? How did he slay Eve? He did it with words. And as a result, the domain in which, into which we're all born, Ephesians 2.2 2 says this, in which you once walked following the course of this world, and then it says this, following the prince of the power of the air. I mean, we all once walked in step with the God of this age, in step with Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So, so Satan is not just a liar, he's a murderer. And so it is with his offspring. Now, when you are born again, that's not true of you anymore. God has changed us. And so the children of God, by the grace of God, we are now life givers, not life takers. We love, we edify, we serve, we invest. Not perfectly, but the Lord has, ch has changed us and is changing us. And this becomes more and more characteristic of the life of someone who's been saved. You're an influence for godliness. You're an influence for holiness. You're an influence for the kingdom of God, for good. In fact, Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. I mean, it is, just as your salvation was predetermined, so were the good works in which you and I will walk once we have been saved. No longer people who are murderers by nature, but the natural man lives to serve himself, to please himself, to defend himself, and to destroy anyone or anything that gets in the way of his own interests. And that's not to say that the lost man always does this rationally. That is to say, it's, it's not that he has these predetermined plans by which he's going to injure other people. No, this is, this is just the default behavior. This is just what is in his nature. He comes first. One of the clearest evidences that someone is unregenerate is they are hopelessly selfish. James chapter 4 verse 2 says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. How do you explain the warring nature of the natural man? It's, it's all about desire, and it's all about desire centered on himself. Isaiah 59, verse 7 says, Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. This is what Paul is quoting. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold, darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. Why are things the way they are among men? It's because of what is in man. And he is by nature someone who destroys. Desolation and destruction are in their highways because their thoughts, Isaiah 59, are thoughts of iniquity. This is why they're swift to shed innocent blood. So when you look at the behavior of man, what do you see? You see that he is a murderer by nature, a murderous creature. The second thing we see in our verses, man is not only now, since the fall, a murderous creature, he is a miserable creature. Verse 16, in their paths are ruin and misery, 
and the way of peace they have not known. Because he is a murderous creature, his life produces misery. He is an influence for misery. He is an influence for ruin in the lives of others. That, that's what is really chiefly on display here. It's not that he himself experiences ruin and misery, though that is true. What is being emphasized in these verses is his influence, what he produces, what, what he affects as a result of his sinful condition. Tom Schreiner comments, of course, human evil isn't confined to the tongue. It ultimately expresses itself in society. Murder and killing document its existence in a world that has all too often turned toward barbarism. When Paul says destruction and misery are in their paths, he doesn't refer to the subjective feeling of misery and unhappiness that sin brings. His point is that human beings inflict destruction and misery on other people. The murderous creature is a force for misery. But having acknowledged that that's the emphasis of the verse, as Paul uses it, we still need to notice how Paul is, is tracing what man's spiritual condition is. He moves from man's character to his mouth to his behavior. It is still an inside-out look at man that we are receiving. And so it is still true to say that man produces destruction and misery because he is full of destruction and misery. He is an idolater by nature. And God has made us to be satisfied in God. God has created us for what is the highest good, that is the glory of God, and to find our joy in Him. So when man replaces God, when he worships and serves the creature instead of the Creator, he is an empty soul constantly desiring, constantly wanting, but constantly frustrated. Because even when he gets what he thinks will satisfy him, he finds it doesn't satisfy him. There is no end to the search. And in this constant grasping after something that will fill the void in his own soul, whatever gets in the way of this quest, he ruins And this gets displayed in society. Why is society full of destruction? Why is society full of men mistreating each other? Why is society full of misery? It's because of who man is. He's a miserable creature because he's a wicked creature. I told you this morning, I'll repeat it tonight. What is startling to me is that people who say they believe the Scriptures don't always believe this description of mankind. How far did man fall? What has been the effect in man's own person as a result of Adam's fall? This is not a mild picture, is it? And what this results in is constant warring. You see verse 17? And the way of peace they have not known. Man in his natural condition is unacquainted with the way of peace, true peace, God's peace, the kind of peace that man not only can know in his own life through the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, but the kind of peace in relationships and fellowship that only God can produce. Lost man is absent that peace, unacquainted with that peace. His way, the natural man's way, is the way of conflict. It's the way of warring. It's the way of fighting. As we read earlier in the book of James, 1 Timothy confirms this as well. Paul, in 1 Timothy 6, describes false teachers. We know from Scripture that false teaching has demonic origins. And what characterizes 
those who dis- do disseminate false teaching, and those who receive it. What, what characterizes this? 1 Timothy 6.3 says this, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. And then it says this, He has an unhealthy craving for controversy. And for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. What a description! of false teachers, loving controversy, fighting with words, acting in a way, teaching in a way that produces envy and dissension and slander and evil suspicions. Can't be any peace where people are constantly suspicious of one another in ways that are evil. Constant friction among people who are depraved in their thinking and deprived of the truth. When your mind has not been made right by the grace of God and salvation in Jesus Christ, and when you are a stranger to the truth, you cannot know a life of peace. And so everything in your life and around your life will be characterized in one way or another, in ways that are overt and in ways that are more hidden, but nonetheless, in one way or another, there's going to be the strife and the conflict and the ruin and the misery that belongs to the domain of darkness. So the wayward world is a warring world, and as a result, it's a wearying world. I mean, even as a Christian, as someone who knows the peace of God, as someone who knows peace in your home, as someone who can come here and and experience the joy of peace peaceful fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, can we not say tonight that at times this world wearies us with its warring? Constant conflict. Why? Because this is who man is since the fall. He is a murderous creature. He is a miserable creature. And the third way we can categorize what Paul writes here, verse 18, is that man is now, since the fall, man is a mutinous creature, rebellious, refusing to acknowledge God's authority. Verse 18 says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the crowning description. This is the all-encompassing way of describing what man has become through Adam's fall, what man is by nature since the fall. If you want to wrap it all up and and encapsulize it all, you can say this, he doesn't fear God. The respect that God deserves, the worship that God deserves, the belief that God deserves. Does God deserve to be believed? The fear, the healthy kind of trepidation that an almighty God deserves, all of it is missing from man's perspective. It's interesting how this is is put, isn't it? There is no fear of God before their eyes. The fear of the Lord is missing from man's point of view. The fear of the Lord is missing from man's way of looking at life. We can say, as the Scriptures say, man's spiritual eyes are blind. And his spiritual ears are deaf. Psalm 36 verse 1 says, "'Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart.'" There is no fear of God before his eyes. Paul quoting from Psalm 36. And in that context, when God says, 
that there is no fear of God before man's eyes, he says at the same time, there is something man pays attention to. There is something that gets his attention. There is something he's tuned into. There is something that that dictates how he views life, what he chooses in life, what he desires in life. The Bible says transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. Sin is talking to him. It has his ear. It informs his decisions. God is not heard. God God is not the natural man's focus. God is not the natural man's appetite. Instead, God is dishonored. He is ignored. He is rebelled against. He is hated. And as a result, what, what this is, is foolishness. What is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So this sin-flooded perspective is a foolish perspective, and it leads not only to foolish words, it leads to foolish lives. And that gets put on display in society at large. Second Chronicles 19 verse 7 says, Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do. For there is no injustice with the Lord our God or partiality or taking bribes. What happens when the fear of the Lord is absent? Well, there's dishonest behavior. There's injustice. There's partiality. There's the taking of bribes. But if you fear the Lord, you're careful what you do. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. Do you get that? All those who practice it. Do you know the fear of the Lord is practiced? The fear of the Lord is not just an attitude. You say, I, I fear the Lord, do you? Because if we fear the Lord, we, we practice that fear. In other words, I could ask you this, how do you learn the fear of the Lord? Where do you learn it? Where is this perspective formed? Where there is fear of God in your eyes. Where do you get that vantage point from? Butch read it earlier in Psalm 19. In the ninth verse, in Psalm 19, what is being celebrated? God's revelation. God's revelation in general terms, then God's revelation in specific terms. God's revelation in Scripture. And there, as he is describing, as the psalmist is describing the Word of God, that's what's being described, the Word of God. In the ninth verse, it says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He's going through this list of ways in which The the law of God is being described. The Word of God is being described. And one of the ways it's described is the fear of the Lord. How do you practice the fear of the Lord? You practice Scripture. How do you learn the fear of the Lord? You listen to God. You listen to His Word. You believe His Word. You obey His Word. You submit to His Word. You delight in His Word. And in that way, you praise Him and worship Him. And that wisdom, that fear is offered to mankind. Does anybody want to know the fear of the Lord? It's available to you. Wisdom personified in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 24 speaks to us. What does God's wisdom say to us? Because I have called and you refuse to listen have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded because you've ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. Let that sink in. The wisdom of God will not just counsel you, it will reprove you. It will rebuke us, won't it? It calls for us to change. 
And God's wisdom says to us, because people don't listen, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm. And your calamity comes like a whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. The complacency of fools. God says, here I am. Here is the fear of me. Here is my truth. And men ignore it because they hate it, refuse it. Maybe in their minds, put it off to another day when they fulfilled all that they want to do. All their devices have been satisfied. Then maybe I'll listen to God. But that section of Proverbs ends this way, but whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Isn't that wonderful? We listen to the Lord and what do we, what do we have in our lives? We have security, we have peace, we have no fear. So how do you learn the fear of the Lord? You learn it from the Word of God. Obviously, meeting with the Word of God in the place of regenerate faith, I mean, there must be salvation in Jesus Christ. Christ is God's wisdom to us. So Christ is offered to us. To refuse Him is to one day be filled with the fruit of your own devices. To, to receive Him is now to have all of the storehouses of the wisdom of God open to you in Him. And as you learn the Word of God, you learn the fear of God. And as you walk in the Word of God, you practice the fear of the Lord. What all this means is that man is murderous and responsible. He is miserable and responsible. He is mutinous and responsible. Now take all of this picture together. What is man in terms of his character? Nobody righteous. Nobody who understands. Nobody seeks for God. Everybody's on the wrong road. Everybody has been made worthless by sin. Nobody does good. Not even one. Man is spiritually dead. How do we know? Listen to him. He opens his mouth and the grave comes out. He is dead and his speech reveals it. He deceives and his speech reveals it. He is full of deadly poison and his speech reveals it. He hates God and hates his fellow man and his speech reveals it. And what is in his heart and on his lips becomes his pathway. It shows up in how he lives and how he lives is murderous. And it is that because it's miserable. And it is that because he is mutinous. And if you let the Bible inform you, then you have to ask, is there any hope for such a creature? What is the hope? How, how far did man fall? Do we just need to give him a, a hand, kind of just lift him up off the ground? Does he just need a little encouragement? Does he need to turn over a new leaf, learn some new ways, change his practices? What, what does he need? He needs grace. 
He needs the grace of God. He needs he needs to be raised up together with Christ. He's not in a hospital bed, he's in a tomb. Doesn't need a doctor, he needs a resurrection. And praise be to God, there is hope for such people. We all can testify to it because that's who we all once were. There is hope for such people. The hope is found in Christ. What I'm saying to you is this, you will only glorify the grace of God as it should be glorified when you will fully acknowledge man's sinful condition. When you think man is just maimed by sin, not slain by sin, then maybe you look at what God has done in Jesus Christ and you say, that's really nice. But when you understand that man is dead in trespasses and sins, then what God has done, only God could have done. And you give him praise. You know this passage very well, but we're going to finish with this tonight. I want you to look with me at Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to read this and then pray. Ephesians chapter 2. And look at verse 1. This is your spiritual biography, Christian. And this is the hope for every lost person you know. Every friend at work, every family member who, who is lost, anybody you have influence with and you're sharing the gospel with them, this is their hope and the only hope they have. God's Word says this, and you, Christian, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Let me just insert a thought. When you ever really get this picture, you will realize you cannot measure the kindness you've been shown. You cannot measure the grace on display in your case. It is immeasurable. Verse 8, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Just as all mankind is under sin, and there's not one exception. So everyone in the kingdom of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, has zero room to boast, and there is not one exception. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, not reformed, brand new. In Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Is there any hope for the people described in Romans 3, 9 through 18? The answer is the hope is the very one whom we've offended. The hope is the very one whose wrath we deserve. The hope is God in Christ Jesus. And the good news is that He has offered that hope to anyone who will receive it, 
to anyone who will listen, to anyone who will turn to his son. So that if one day you die with a stiff neck, having refused wisdom's call, you will be fully responsible. Because God gave his only son that whoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And those who've been rescued would say, Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your grace and your mercy to this world in your Son. I want to thank you along with my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Lord, personally for your mercy to me. When I was lost, when I was blind, when I was deaf, when I was a murderous person by nature and a miserable person and a mutinous person, when I was not seeking you, when there was no righteousness in me, when I was incapable of doing good, when my mouth would open and out would come hell, you had mercy upon me. And what I have now in your Son is not explained by me in any way, shape, or form. It is all your doing. It is grace, grace, grace. We are your work. And we can't measure the kindness that's on display in our case. The ages to come are necessary to reveal it. And for the rest of eternity, we won't be able to measure it. I pray that as a result, our hearts and mouths would be full of praise. That on our tongues would be the story of Christ the good news of salvation, and that we would take our responsibility to be ambassadors to heart. And as we leave here tonight, we would be mindful of beggars all around us who are in need of the same sustenance that you gave us in your Son. Help us to see this world as it is, Lord, our mission field. May we go forth with our only hope being in you, the power of your gospel, the power that you have to save. We will give you praise as you do much through our meager efforts for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.